So with that, we're going to transition over to step two. Um, Rich, you want to take this one? Uh, sure. Thanks, Brian. Um, and in step two, what you're going to do is identify the performance obligations in the contract that you've identified. Um, now, the, the overall objective of step two is um, to identify the, the units of account that you're then going to apply steps three to five to. And conceptually, that, that's the same as the objective of the um, the multiple element arrangement guidance that exists in current U.S. GAAP. Um, the first step in identifying these performance obligations in the contract is to identify all of the promised goods or services in the contract. And then you determine whether those um, promised goods or services represent performance obligations. And to do that, you, you got to consider both explicit and implicit obligations. Now, the, the explicit obligations might be somewhat obvious um, when you got, for example, a a stated obligation to transfer equipment to a customer. But um, in contrast, an, an implicit obligation might not be as obvious. And an example of an implicit um, obligation would be something like a, a business practice that you might have of, um, in the software industry of always providing when and if available software upgrades to customers, even if you're not contractually required to do that. Now, as it says down here at the bottom, um, not all activities that an entity performs in connection with the contract provide um, or, or transfer goods or services to the customer. You know, for example, setup activities. Um, those are activities that the entity has to perform in order to be able to transfer the promised good or service, but they don't transfer goods or services to the customer themselves. Um, so those types of activities wouldn't be considered performance obligations. Now, there, there is an accounting policy election um, available now, under the election, if there are goods or services that are immaterial in the context of the contract, they don't have to be identified for um, further evaluation under the guidance. Um, now, the expedient does not do away with um, the requirement to, to evaluate whether there's any optional goods or services that represent a material right to the customer. That still has to be done. Um, but if an entity elects this um, policy election, then what they have to do is accrue the cost of the goods or the services that are immaterial in the context of the contract. Um, and then if the entity recognize that's you know if the entity recognizes the revenue before the goods or services are, are transferred. Um, this issue is one of the ones that came up through the transition resource group that Brian was talking about earlier. The, the existing model um, contained guidance on inconsequential or perfunctory performance obligations. And you'd have some items that don't qualify as deliverables under the existing model because they're they're either inconsequential or perfunctory. Um, you might have a, a requirement to um, stand ready to answer questions about some consumer product because you gave out a, a telephone number on a, uh, for a helpline or something. Or, or maybe you have a promise to deliver an account statement to a customer. You promise to deliver additional copies of intellectual property that you've licensed to a customer after you've already you know, delivered the initial copy. So this policy election was added by ASU 2016-10, and the purpose of um, this policy was to, to be similar to that current guidance on the inconsequential or perfunctory deliveries. So if you do apply this election, you don't have to identify goods or services that are immaterial in the context of the contract. Also, you wouldn't have to evaluate the, the aggregate of all immaterial goods or services. Now, I mentioned that the election doesn't change the requirement to evaluate whether the optional goods or services represent a material right to the customer. There's specific guidance to determine if these options are, you know, are promised goods or services and based on whether the option provides a material right that the customer wouldn't get without entering into the contract. Now, this slide addresses uh, shipping and handling activities. And uh, under current GAAP, um, shipping and handling, generally, they're not considered a deliverable that you'd allocate revenue to, regardless of when it's performed. Now, there were some differing views uh, as to the guidance in the original ASU 2014-09 on whether it would have um, placed a requirement on companies um, or to, you know, whether shipping and handling activities that occurred after control of the good was transferred, should that be identified as a performance obligation? And if it was a performance obligation, and that means that companies would have to allocate revenue to the shipping and handling activities and defer that revenue until those activities were performed. 
Um, what ASU 2016-10 does is it, it makes it clear that these fulfillment activities that occur before transfer of control, so situations where the, the shipping turns a FOB destination, those are not promised goods or services, and, and therefore they're not um, performance obligations. Um, but 2016-10 amends the guidance so that um, entities have an election to make on shipping and handling activities that occur after control of a good is transferred. So companies can keep the model from today and, and treat the activity as a fulfillment, fulfillment activity, or they can treat it as a separate performance obligation, which would mean that they, they'd have to allocate some revenue to it. So once you've identified the, um, the promised goods or services, you then need to take a look to see if the good or service is, quote, unquote, distinct. And if it is, then you'd account for it separately as a performance obligation. And if it is not distinct, you, you combine it with other promised goods or services until there's a, a group that's distinct. And on the next couple of slides, we'll, we'll talk about what criteria you need to meet for the good or service to be considered distinct. Um, but, but there's an exception in the guidance referred to as the series exception um, for not treating an individual obligation as a separate performance obligation. Now, under this series exception, when you've got a promised good or service that's part of a series of distinct goods or services that are substantially the same and have the same pattern of transfer to the customer, in the series of the distinct goods and services performance obligation, not the individual um, perform, uh, individual item. So Brian mentioned policy elections, practical expedience. This is not one of them. The series exception is not optional, it, it, so it's not, a, not an election that you have to apply it. Uh, and an example of uh, one of these situations where the series exception would apply, um, let's say you have satellite TV service and you've locked it in for a one-year period. You know, if you look at it from a pure technical standpoint, each day or, or maybe even each hour, you would consider that a performance obligation because each hour of service is distinct to the customer uh, because the customer benefits from each hour separately. But because each day or hour is substantially the same and it's transferred over time, you'd consider it to be one performance obligation under this series exception. I mentioned the concept of distinct. Um, a, a promised good or service is distinct if it is both capable of being distinct and separately identifiable from other promises in the contract or what they refer to as distinct within the context of the contract. Now, the notion of um, capable of being distinct, that's fairly similar, somewhat similar to the, the standalone value guides that we have in the existing gap today. Um, the difference here is that it has to be evaluated for both delivered and undelivered items under 606. As far as the second item, the separately identifiable from other promises in the contract or the distinct within the context, um, the, the new guidance introduces different and um, incremental criteria that, that have to be looked at. And it could result in combining goods or services that you account for separately today. Now, capable of being distinct. Um, as it says at the top here, a promised good or service is capable of being distinct when a customer can benefit from the promised good or service on its own or together with other readily available resources. Uh, and some examples of when a promised good or service is capable of being distinct, as it says here, the, the entity regularly sells the good or service separately, or the customer can sell the good or service on a standalone basis for something other than scrap value. Um, the customer can use the good or service together um, with the, a good or service that they already have that's already been transferred to it by the entity. Um, so installation service can be used with the equipment. You know, you, you deliver the equipment up front and then the installation service comes in. Um, or the, the customer can use the good or service together with the good or service that's readily available from other sources in the marketplace. Now, when you're looking at whether a promised good or service is separately identifiable from other promises in the contract, the, the overall objective is to determine whether the promise is to transfer individual promised goods or services, or is it to transfer a combined item that the, the promised goods or services um, act as inputs to. So there isn't anything in the current guidance that's 
comparable to this guidance. And so what that means is that, as I alluded to earlier, you might have some things that you account for separately today that are not going to be accounted for separately under um, the model that's under 606. And the, the guidance provides some indicators that help in evaluating this criteria, criteria but I just want to note here that it's going to involve a lot of judgment, this um, particular aspect of the model. Um, one indicator is, um, is the promised good or service transferred individually. If it is transferred individually, then the, the promised good or service is separately identifiable. And then you got another um, indicator that is, is the, the transfer a combined item or items that the, the promised goods or services are inputs to. Um, if that's the case, then the promised good or service is not separately identifiable. Now, a um, few indicators on this slide that the, the promised good or service is not separately identifiable from other promises in the contract. Um, so if the entity provides a significant service of integrating the promised goods or services into one or more combined outputs, and then the, the customer, <clears throat> then the promised goods or services, excuse me, are not separately identifiable from other promises in the contract. And this is going to apply in a number of um, construction contracts. You know, for example, you have a general contractor that provides contract management service to make sure all construction tasks are being performed properly by subcontractors and the, the general contractor takes on risks that are associated with the integration. Um, another indicator is that uh, if one or more of the promised goods or services significantly modify or customize one or more of the other promised goods or services in the contract. So let's say um, you have a software company that sells software and installs it, but installation um, involves significant changes to the underlying software so they can operate with um, all the customers' uh, previously existing software. Now, some might argue there that the company isn't offering software and installation because they're not separately identifiable from one another, but instead they're offering a a fully integrated software system because of that significant modification and customization. Therefore, that should be accounted for as a, a single performance obligation. A, a third indicator that a promised good or service is not separately identifiable is if the promised goods or services are um, highly interdependent or highly interrelated with each other so that each of the promised goods or services in the contract is um, significantly affected by other promised goods or services in the contract. When you're evaluating whether these goods or services are highly interdependent or interrelated, you, you base that evaluation on whether the, the goods or services are dependent on each other instead of just looking to see if one item depends on the other. So if, if you sell a product and maintenance, you wouldn't automatically conclude that the, the products and maintenance are automatically highly interrelated and interdependent on one another just because the maintenance would only be purchased by a customer that had first purchased the, the related product. So while maintenance might be considered interrelated with the product, you know, this particular indicator would only be met if the product is considered to be interrelated with the, the maintenance as well. So um, you know, wh whether the product is significantly affected by the maintenance because any customer buying the product would, would also have to buy the maintenance um, for the product to work as, uh, as intended. And there are a number of examples illustrating the concept that um, the FASB put into uh, 6061055. Now, there is a practical expedient available here. Um, you can apply the new guidance in 606 to a portfolio of um, similar performance obligations across multiple customers if, if doing that is not um, reasonably expected to uh, result in a materially different outcome. Now, the next slide here addresses warranties. Um, the accounting for warranties under the new model d depends on a variety of factors. The, the first thing you consider is, does the customer have the option to purchase the, warrant, the warranty separately? Um, if they can buy it separately, treat it as a performance obligation. But if it can't be bought separately, then you look to see whether the warranty provides the customer with the service that's in addition to the assurance that the, the product complies with the you know, stated specifications. And a few things to consider when you're making that determination, you'd include things like, um, is the warranty required by law? Um, how long is the warranty coverage period? Um, what, what's the nature of the task that the entity promises to perform? 
under the energy. So you, you consider things like that and you come up with, um, you know, the question of if the warranty does, does provide the customer with the service that's considered to be in addition to the assurance that the product complies with the specifications, then the warranty might be a uh, performance obligation separately. But if it doesn't provide the customer with that additional service, then it's not a performance obligation. Now, if you do treat it as a performance obligation, you're going to allocate some of the transaction price to it and likely going to recognize that amount over time while the transaction price that you've allocated to a related product is likely going to be recognized at a point in time. And then the last thing to cover in step two is options for additional goods or services. Um, this is an area, you know, you know, determining whether an option for additional goods or services is a performance obligation. That's going to require a lot of judgment as well. Um, now, if, if you've got one of these options that is accounted for as a performance obligation, you're going to allocate some of the transaction price to it. And you're going to recognize that allocated amount as revenue in the future separately from the transaction price that's allocated to, to other promised goods or services in the contract. At the top here, there's a couple of examples of these options for additional goods or service. So you got an option to purchase additional goods or service in the future at a discount or uh, award credits and customer loyalty programs like um, frequent flyer plans or something like that that you can accumulate and then use to get you know, a, a flight in the future or something like that. Um, so these things, again, if you do end up with one of the options as a performance obligation, you've got to allocate some of the transaction consideration to it and recognize that um, at some point in the future. 